one. Connoisseurship. <laughs> but I know there's quite a few Brits here, so I'll do the rest of it in English, OK? Uh, I'd just like to say thanks to uh, IBI for inviting me along today, and thanks for all of you for staying here for this last session. Um, and uh, if you are one of those who went out for chips at 3 p.m., I salute you, um, because I crashed out at one o'clock, and I'm feeling slightly jaded, I've got to be honest. Um, OK, so how does an old school medium like radio remain relevant in a digital world? Well, from my perspective, probably the best place to start is to establish how relevant radio is currently. And when you look at the facts, it's interesting to see how robust old school media actually are from a consumer perspective despite the huge growth in ad spend online that we've seen in the UK and happening in Ireland now. Um, in fact, it made me wonder whether a more appropriate title for this session would be, what is the relevance of digital in a broadcast linear world? Because we're still living in a world where broadcast linear media dominates consumer time spent with media. UK uh, IPA's Touchpoint study shows that radio is the second biggest medium after TV and accounts for about a quarter of all time spent with media. And between the two of them, TV and radio account for about three quarters of people's media time. And that's not including TV and radio content that's consumed online, which makes up a pretty significant minority of the time spent using the internet. Um, and uh, you know, these are UK figures, but my sense is that this is a pretty similar pattern around the world. So why have broadcast linear media remained so robust? Well. Behavioural economics, I think I'm the first person to say that today, do I get an award? Um, confirms something that I've known about myself for a long time, which is that human beings are fundamentally lazy. They don't want to think or work too hard to get what they want. That's one of the reasons that brands are successful. You know, they basically offer simple shortcuts to avoid people having to think in detail about every purchase they make. With TV and radio, people are just one flick of a switch away from high value content, edited and scheduled on their behalf by experts. Why go to the bother of working hard if somebody's going to do it for you? I think that's why the vast majority of TV and radio content is still consumed live, as shown in this chart. It's effortless, up-to-date, very good quality, and mainly free. You might be able to find something better out there, but it's going to take you effort, and it might well cost you some money as well. So broadcast media are still very popular with consumers, but the UK RAB, people like to remind us about the rapid growth and scale of social media and question us about its potential impact on radio audience. So this is what we show them. Sometimes it's difficult to get a perspective on newer media because they tend to quote stats that are non-comparable. So I was particularly happy that uh, Deloitte did some work in this field last year and they presented it at the Media Garden Guardian Edinburgh TV Festival. Basically, this chart demonstrates that when it comes to time spent, radio is more than 20 times the size of Facebook the largest of the social media reviewed in this study. So if we judge relevance in terms of audience size, radio appears to be in pretty good shape. But is it still playing a relevant role in people's lives? Well, the death knell for radio's role in music discovery has been talked about already today, and has been sounding for many years, particularly loudly in the last couple of years, with the launch of new algorithms in Spotify and the such like to aid discovery. However, this research from Nielsen in the US from last autumn highlights that radio remains the number one source for new music discovery. These are the top three. Listeners value the connection with experts, playing stuff they haven't heard for people just like you. The challenge, I think, for the industry is remaining number one in this field in the future. Beyond music discovery, there's another important role that radio plays in people's lives, that of emotional life support as people go about their daily routine. Whilst it's a role that all media play to a certain extent, our Media in the Mood of the Nation survey established that radio made people feel happier and more energetic than other media. The human connection to the wider world was found to be extremely important. Live presenters were a vital part of this. Difficult to see how you can replace this with technology. Finally, platforms, platforms, platforms. We've been through this quite a lot today, but I should point out that digital platforms, far from eating into radio's audience, have actually presented radio brands with new ways of getting content to people, making the media more accessible and ubiquitous than it's ever been. However, new devices mean more competition. And uh, I saw some research at Radio Days Europe in Berlin, which uh, showed that the laptop 
is now the primary device for accessing radio amongst 18 to 24s. And there's huge growth in terms of mobile and tablets as well. And what that means is people have got access to lots of competition in the same device as radio. So, the medium remains relevant from an audience perspective, I believe, but it needs to exploit its real points of difference to remain so, as well as expand into relevant content offerings on other platforms. But the next question is, is radio still relevant for advertisers? And if so, how can it enhance relevance? To give some context, I'm going to refer to the long and the short of it. A new analysis conducted by a couple of consultants, Peter Field and Les Binnett, on behalf of the IPA, which examines 30 years of IPA effectiveness data, incorporating some 1,000 advertising case studies. This robust study examines the different effects of advertising on business performance across a range of outcomes, including profit, sales, price sensitivity. Now, the headline finding from this was that advertisers need to ensure that their campaigns strike the right balance between long-term investment in brand building using mass media, designed to stimulate implicit emotional responses to build brand equity, combined with short-term approaches to stimulate sales through on- and offline response, using explicit, persuasive communication. Campaigns that use both in harmony are more effective, more efficient, and more profitable. And interestingly, the study found that despite the huge increase in exciting, targeted activation opportunities across the last 10 years, the optimum ratio in terms of investment to deliver the best business effects over time remains 60-40 in favor of brand building activity. The authors stated that obsessing solely about short-term sales is self-defeating. Brands need to invest for the longer term as that is where the greater success lies. Within this context, the study also contains some interesting insight into effective targeting revealing that attempting to build deep, loyal relationships with existing customers is less effective than investing in advertising that reaches as wide an audience as possible. Brands which target the whole market achieve three times as many large business effects, such as profit, sales, market share, or a reduction in price sensitivity, as those that focus on existing customers. It's clear that tight audience targeting, whilst desirable for activation strategies, does not help long-term success. Great, you might be thinking, why is this all relevant to radio? Well, there's only two editorial media that really deliver the reach and involvement required to help drive brand building activities, and that's TV and radio, as demonstrated in this touch points chart. And I think with lower entry costs than TV and greater regional flexibility, that's a huge selling point for radio, but I think it's one that isn't really exploited by many brand advertisers currently. Now, partly this could be due to a lack of understanding or confidence in how um, the medium builds brands. Uh, so to gain optimum benefit from this as an industry, we need to demonstrate the medium's relevance to brand advertisers through initiatives like Radio Gauge, which are run in Ireland now, um, which reports back on how radio shifts brand consideration, brand relevance, brand awareness, and the such like. Now, in the UK, we've been running uh, Radio Gauge for five years, and we've built up uh, 600 campaigns that we've measured over that time. And we now make all of that data aggregated up and present it through this online tool. So if you'd like to go in and get some pretty solid evidence for radio uh, from the UK website for the time being, please go and have a look at Radio Gauge Predict online. And I'm sure over time you'll be building up your own Irish benchmarks through the continuing use of Radio Gauge. Now, when it comes to activation, there's less of a challenge, I think, about radio's ability to drive these sort of strategies. And Historical REB research in the UK and in other markets, uh, the Netherlands being one of them, has quantified the extent to which radio can drive online response and offline sales. If you want more information on these, they're on the website, and I think Jason's going to talk a bit more about one of these. Uh, but activation is where digital, I think, is ahead of the game, where precision targeting delivers more efficient response. Advertisers and agencies are investing more and more money into such approaches and increasingly overlooking media that can't deliver real-time targeting. So where does radio sit in this context? Well, different groups are taking different approaches in the UK. I think uh, what's particularly interesting is Absolute's uh, testing in-stream audio ads targeting logged-in listeners. Um, and I think it's attracted a lot of attention from agencies over the last year. But I think that the, the real challenge in this field of precision targeting is that 
that agencies are seeking easy access to precision targeting, but at scale. Which I think makes Radio Player particularly interesting. James mentioned Radio Player earlier. Matt's mentioned Radio Player. Um, so it's my turn now. Um, you know, Radio Player is a central access uh, uh, point. I want to say portal, but it's not. But I think there's an opportunity, perhaps, to start to take advantage of this common interface for UK radio stations and build up scale and maybe some centrally developed commercial opportunities that can make agencies really sit up and take notice of radio in this respect. And that's something we're sort of taking a first few early steps in exploring whether that's opportunity. So, to summarise, I'm broadly optimistic about radio remaining relevant in a digital world. Of course I would be. But I think my confidence is built out of radio's relevance for listeners still. And I think this, its scale of audience really establishes how important that is. Uh, and that also means that it has particular relevance for advertisers engaged in brand building activities. And I think that's got to be a source of business for the radio industry. But we need to generate more evidence to promote the medium's relevance in this field and build confidence. And as I said, Radio Gauge, I think, is a helpful uh, development in that respect. <coughs> and finally, there's a real chance to grasp the opportunity offered by technology to enhance the medium's relevance further for activation strategies and give a clear sense of priorities for the future. And I think collaboration within the radio industry is going to be very important in this respect. So thanks very much for your time. Cheers.